Well, welcome everyone to our webinar on the Hobo MX soil moisture loggers. My name is Paul Gannett. I'm product manager for our Hobo standalone loggers. And I've had the pleasure of working with our engineers over the years to develop our lines of uh, Hobo data loggers. And uh, in particular, I helped uh, the engineers uh, with the development of the loggers I'm going to be talking about with you today, the MX soil moisture loggers. Um, just uh, in case somebody's not hearing me, I show this slide just as a little prompt. Uh, I figure the webinar is going to last for about 50 minutes. Uh, I'm allowing time for questions, so depending upon how many questions you have, we may go as long as, uh, as an hour. Um, I have embedded some questions into the presentation. You'll see as we go along. Thank you to those of you who sent questions in advance so that I could uh, uh, you know, include those and make sure we've covered those, those questions. But uh, if you have questions as we go along, feel free to enter them into the questions box. Uh, if they're uh, tied into what we're talking about at the time, I may cover them then, or I uh, may wait and cover them at the end. This webinar is being recorded, and we'll make it available to all of you uh, as a recording that you can view at a later time. Uh, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with Onset, but for those of you who aren't, we are the um, designers and producers and manufacturers of the Hobo data loggers. We uh, make them right here in our facility on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. And our sole focus is data loggers. That's what we live and breathe. We've been around since 1981, so we've had a lot of experience in this area. Here's what I'm going to be covering today. Uh, first, I'm going to start out with just a little bit about why are soil moisture and temperature important. I'm sure many of you already have uh, some uh, reasons that they're important to your work. That's why you're here today. Uh, then I'll jump into uh, an overview of our product, talk about some of the key features, some of the measurements it provides or they provide, some key specs, a little bit about installation and deployment. Then some application examples, just a couple of those, uh, some accessories and options, and then uh, additional time for question and answers that we haven't covered during the presentation. So with that, let me jump right on in. Turn off my camera. You don't need to see me. So uh, one of the big areas we expect these to be applied is in agricultural research. Uh, we're People are looking to save water through increased uh, efficiency of irrigation or finding crops that use less water. Obviously, saving water is very important. Uh, also, uh, you may be looking to improve your yields and our quality, uh, reducing runoff. We're all concerned about uh, uh, environmental impacts of um, uh, of agriculture and you know you know things in general um, you know there's a lot of places you know lawns which uh, also uh, we have to worry about the runoff affecting the nearby waterways uh, germination and soil microbial activity all important areas oops here we go for some reason it wasn't responding there uh, environmental research is another important uh, application. Uh, forest management, snowpack retention, again, reducing erosion and, and runoff, protecting our ecosystems in these times of climate change, uh, as well as hydrology. Uh, soil moisture is very important for that. And then smaller growing operations and nurseries, uh, we ex uh, expect these will be uh, valuable in those applications, saving water, a lot of the same things that the, uh, the uh, researchers were trying to do, but now on the actual commercial side, we're actually trying to grow crops and, and uh, you know, save water, improve your yields, uh, you know, avoiding harmful runoff, as well as um, uh, site selection. And a lot of times you need to evaluate a site uh, and match the crop to that uh, site that you're going to be planting in. 
So now jumping into the products themselves, we are offering two configurations. The first one is the MX Soil Moisture Logger, the 2306, uh, and that just has a soil moisture sensor. Then there's the MX 2307, which has a temperature sensor as well. And the, that temperature sensor has its own uh, cable, and that gives you flexibility in terms of where you can measure temperature. You can vary it in the soil to measure your soil temperatures, or you can uh, deploy it in the air to measure air temperatures in conjunction with your soil moisture data. Both, um, both the temperature cable and the soil moisture cable are two meters, just to make that clear. So one of the key advantages uh, of these loggers is that they're fully integrated. You get them in the box uh, with the cables already attached. Uh, is all you need to do is install the, uh, the software on your device, or if you already have it installed, uh, uh, you're ready to go. There's no uh, complicated setup. And the other big advantage is the uh, accuracy and the reliability of the data. Because they're all integrated, uh, it really helps ensure good weatherproof seals and, and performance over the life of the logger. So getting into some more of the features, well, I've already covered this, the sensor's already attached. Um, another key advantage is they're part of our Hobo MX family, which uh, we keep growing. That includes our MX 2300s, which are in this enclosure you see here, which includes temperature and RH. There's the MX 2200s, which are temperature and light. And then the 2001, so those do water level. So that's quite a suite of measurements that all use the same software, the same Bluetooth communications. Um, you know, the Bluetooth makes them easy to offload. Uh, the Hobo Connect makes for easy configuration and sharing of the data. Um, uh, the, the Hobo Connect software will run on mobile or Windows devices, and each of those platforms has its own advantages. So uh, you can freely go back and forth between those two environments uh, and, and still work with the same set of loggers. Uh, they also have the option for automatic data upload uh, to HoboLink from the HoboConnect software. The, um, as I mentioned, it's got a range of measurements. And then there's also the option for an MX gateway. Now, this is an indoor gateway, so it's you know not something that's for remote sites. But uh, if you're in a uh, uh, climate-controlled greenhouse, for example, that provides a convenient way of automatically uh, getting your data up to the internet, and you can also get features like alarm notifications. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So, uh, I see my first question here, so I'm going to jump over to that because uh, I like questions. It kind of breaks up the, uh, the presentation a little bit. It says, can I connect soil moisture sensors to weather stations from your company? I'm actually going to talk a little bit about soil moisture options that we offer later on, but these loggers are a standalone data loggers. They they um, they don't connect up to a station, so they only log data within their own memory. So uh, if you're looking for sensors to plug into our stations, we have other choices, uh, which I'll talk about later. So thanks, thank you for the question. These loggers use the Teros 10 soil moisture sensors. And I'll talk more about those uh, in a couple slides. There's four ways to get your soil moisture data, because I know there's different ways you like to look at it. And I'll talk more about those in the, the slides uh, to follow. Uh, there's the optional soil temperature sensor, which I mentioned already. And the uh, price, we try to keep them affordable. Now, these are US prices. Obviously, the prices in different countries will vary, but for the basic soil moisture logger, you're looking at $340 US. Uh, for temperature and soil moisture, it's $399. So, all right. Um, I've got a couple other questions. Um, I'm gonna, yeah, I think, I'm going to save these for later. Can I temper? Well, here's the question. Can the soil sensors be added to the MX 2300s that have temperature and RH already? Um, the, the question is no, because they're pre-configured. These sensors 
come attach to the logger, there's, there's not the option to uh, swap these sensors uh, between uh, the different loggers. If, you, if you're looking for the flexibility of plug-in sensors, uh, you're, you're probably best off looking at our microstation, which has uh, uh, four or five inputs for uh, up to five uh, plug-in sensors. And that, that gives you the flexibility to switch between temperature RH and temperature and soil moisture. That's your best, best bet there. So the uh, Teros 10 uh, soil moisture sensor, this has uh, a couple of very sharp stainless steel spikes, and that has two advantages. One is it makes for easier installation into undisturbed soil. Uh, as you can, if you've used the printed circuit board sensors, which I abbreviate as PCB uh, type sensors, um, these are these new Teros 10 sensors are a lot easier to install. They just kind of stab through the soil uh, as opposed to having to kind of push the soil aside like the old uh, printed circuit board type sensors. And the other advantage of that easier installation is it, it ensures better soil contact, which gives better accuracy. If you've got any sort of air gaps around the soil moisture probes, that can uh, harm your measurement accuracy. So by disturbing less soil, uh, you typically will get better accuracy for that. Oh, uh, somebody was asking for an example of the um, uh, uh, PCB type sensors. Uh, if you're familiar with the uh, EC5 sensors or the 10HS sensors that are made by meter and that we've been integrating into our system, those are what I call uh, PCB type sensors. They're basically a printed circuit board um, that um, uh, has electronics built onto it uh, for measuring soil moisture. They're, we've had great success with those, um, but uh, these, these we expect uh, to perform even better over time. One of the other advantage of these Teros uh, uh, sensors is they've got a much longer service life because of the way they're constructed. Uh, we expect to get about a 10 year service life out of them versus the uh, PCB type sensors, which have a three to five year uh, type service light. So, yeah, I see some more good questions coming in. I'll, I'll try to cover some of these questions as we go because I, I've got some slides that uh, specifically uh, talk to them. Um, so, uh, different uh, types of soil moisture measurements. Uh, our software allows you to choose uh, what type of calibration you want to use. Uh, with the recorded data. The most common is uh, a mineral soil calibration. That's what you'll find in most fields and forests um, and most soil types. Uh, so that's the most common. Then there's the so-called soilless media like potting soil. And uh, that's you know kind of your uh, lighter air, uh, airier uh, soil. So uh, that has a, a slightly different calibration. And then there's something called apparent dielectric permittivity. Now, this is more for the research applications where you have specialized soil moisture equations that can use that data, uh, such as the top equation. We, um, you know, that's really up to you as the user to uh, apply those those uh, higher um, uh, end equ equations, which are usually tied to a specific soil type. The two most common, though, are, we expect are the, the common mineral soils and the soilless media. We also offer an option for percent of field capacity, and I'll actually describe what that is. Some of you may already be familiar with that. Um, the, what that only applies to volumetric water content data. It wouldn't make sense to do that calculation for the apparent dielectric permittivity, so it's just the water content type data for mineral soils or soilless soils. Uh, and it's calculated in Hobo Connect. So that means we can't actually generate alarms in the logger uh, for that. So to set that up, you basically just turn it on in our software, say enable percent of field capacity, and then you enter in uh, the field capacity of your field. And that's something you'll determine either empirically by looking at the, uh, you know, your, your fields, or maybe you'll get it from the local Cooperative Extension uh, Agency. So just to help understand percentage of field capacity, first I want to just look at field capacity. 
and that's the amount of water remaining in the soil uh, after it's been soaked, but had time to drain. So, um, and that is kind of this line here, just explaining this graph. These are different soil types. So sand uh, is kind of your one extreme here, where it has a very low field capacity. In other words, the water tends to run right through it, versus clay, which has a very high field capacity up in the 0.4 range, and the water tends to stay in the clay soils for quite a while. Uh, on the other extreme is uh, what we call the permanent wilting point, and this is where the plants may not recover because the soil is so dry. And this is uh, understanding these two uh, lines is important for irrigation management. You want to uh, manage your irrigation between uh, the field capacity and the permanent wilting point. So that's kind of what this graph is showing. So and then to calculate the percent of field capacity, basically all that is, is taking your volumetric water content data and dividing it by your field capacity. So for example, here's some data that's in volumetric water content, kind of going over the range of 0.15 up to uh, 0.25 field capacity is at 0.2. And then if you convert that data to percent of field capacity, you can see 100% is here. Uh, and, and it is possible to be above your field capacity during a rainfall event because your soils become super saturated, but that quickly drains out as you get down to your field capacity and then it gradually declines from there. So, Let's see, let me get into some specs here, just to give you a little sense for the kind of performance you can expect. The accuracy in mineral soils is typically around 3% using the, um, you know, those, you know, the calibrations, the built-in calibrations. And this is for salinities up to eight uh, decibels Siemens per meter. And in soilless media, uh, you're, uh, it's it's a little harder to get accurate measurements, so that's more in the range of 5%, plus or minus 5%. Um, we do use uh, a 70 megahertz uh, signal uh, in the sensor. Now, basically what that means is it's able to accurately measure soil moisture over a wide range of soil types. That's the advantage of those higher frequencies. The volume of influence is 430 milliliters. So it's you know, about half, almost half a liter. And this actually ties into one of the questions, uh, which I just see coming through, which is how efficient are these in rocky soils? And rocky soils are a challenge because they, you know, there's obviously no water where the rocks are contained, but that's still within the measurement volume of the sensor. So by having a larger measurement volume, it kind of averages out the inaccuracies that cause by those rocks. So you know, this is a what I would call a mid-range volume of influence. There are certainly sensors that have a bigger volume of influence, but uh, this has got a pretty decent volume of influence. So if you've got a moderate amount of rocks in there, you're still going to get good measurements. As I mentioned, service life around 10 years. Temperature accuracy uh, is, is uh, typical of, of what we offer in our loggers is 0.2 degrees Celsius. Um, over the range of 0 to 70. As I mentioned earlier, the cable lengths are two meters. Uh, the memory capacity of the logger is, um, uh, is 110,000 measurements, and that's across both channels. So if you're logging both soil moisture and temperature, that's going to be uh, 55,000 uh, sets of measurements. So keep that in mind. That's you know, for most applications, that's that's plenty, especially seeing soil moisture doesn't typically change uh, that much. Uh, it's, you know, 15 minute logging is usually plenty for soil moisture and temperature data, plenty fast enough. Um, they have a two year battery life. That's at a one minute logging interval with Bluetooth always on. So in a lot of cases, you'll get longer than that two year battery life. It is a user replaceable battery. So um, you can get many years of use out of these. Uh, the Bluetooth range is about 100 feet, um, which is, you know, it's a surprisingly good range. I mean, obviously, if you're 
get these out in a uh, you know field of crops that's uh, uh, potentially going to be reduced. So that 100 feet is, is line of sight, but um, it's it's surprising how far you can be away from these loggers to offload the data, which means you don't necessarily have to get out into the middle of your fields to offload the data, which is pretty handy. Oh, I just had a question about that temperature range. Uh, somebody's asking um, the temperature accuracy. I've just specified it from zero to 70 degrees. Um, uh, can it measure outside of that range? Yeah, it measures down to minus 40 and up to 100 degrees Celsius. That's just what the accuracy of the uh, uh, plus or minus two degrees C is just over that range. It, it expands out the accuracies like 0.25 degrees over that wider measurement range. So I'm glad you asked that to, so I could clarify that. And another question here is, um, or a point here I want to make is the operating range. It's minus 25 to 60 degrees C, which is different than our other MX2300 models if you're using it. So it's a little bit more limited. And actually, I'm going to, uh, I've got some preloaded question and answers. I'm going to address uh, that in one of those in a couple slides. The, uh, the environmental rating is, of course, uh, weatherproof. So it's designed for outdoor use. So, now I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. Uh, you've been sending in some questions. I've been addressing those, but I also embedded some question and answers that I've been hearing into the presentation. And one of the questions we get is, is it necessary to calibrate the soil moisture logger or data? And I just wanted to clarify that in most cases, you don't need to do a calibration. The uh, data provided by the, the hobo logger with those two different um, soil type selections uh, is going to uh, be within its accuracy spec spec specification without calibration. There is, however, no way in our software to change those calibration equations. So you, if you want to change the calibration equation, if you've got a specialized soil type, perhaps like a coastal sediment or something like that, uh, then you'll have to do that calibration uh, externally in a, in a program like Excel or something to do the conversion from the data we provide into the uh, the very specific data for the soil you're using. And another question we get is, is um, how long is the uh, sensor accuracy good for? That, the sensor accuracy that we're giving you should be good over the life of the sensor. Of course, if it starts to degrade over time, then you might consider doing a uh, an external soil uh, calibration. Another question uh, we get quite commonly, especially from our friends in uh, colder climates, what happens to the logger when the temperature goes below, below minus 25 degrees C? The, um, the answer is the logger will continue to log. It, uh, you know, the, the battery's rated down to minus 40 degrees C and the logger will continue to operate. The only thing you, that you might find is that the accuracy of the soil moisture measurements um, may be degraded at those lower temperatures. And a lot of times that the soil is frozen anyways. So if the soil is frozen, uh, you know, the, the soil moisture data really isn't valid in any case. You know, just it's, you know, the way the, the physics of the soil moisture measurement work, it's, uh, it's intended for uh, water in its liquid state. You know, another question related to calibration, which we just covered on the previous slide is, can we send the loggers back to uh, onset to get recalibrated? Uh, again, in most cases, I don't think you'll need to, um, uh, recalibrate the sensors. They they are designed so their calibration really doesn't change over time. Um, and at this time, we do not have a recalibration service because we don't think it's going to be necessary. But of course, we could revisit that uh, if there's enough demand. I, I mentioned the volume of influence of 430 milliliters. Um, uh, this is kind of a, a side view of what that volume is. And and you picture a cylinder around the soil moisture sensor the, the measuring uh, the soil moisture within that volume. So it measures it a little bit above the sensor. It measures it below the probes. Of course, it's most sensitive to soil moisture that's along the probes. So they, those have the greatest impact on the measurement accuracy. Um, but um, one of the things I like to point out at this point is this shows um, the, the soil moisture sensor needs to be buried in the soil so that it, all that area uh, and the volume of influence is soil. 
sometimes people think, oh, I can just put the soil moisture sensor on the top of the soil and it will measure soil moisture. Well, it will measure soil moisture, but you're going to be including some air in those soil moisture measurements, so that's going to impact your measurement accuracy. You really want to bury it deep in the, enough in the soil so that uh, it's all, all that volume is in the soil. And here's a question I saw a couple of you asked uh, earlier is uh, what is the length of the sensor rods? Uh, they're 5.4 centimeters or uh, a little over two inches and your total height is um, a little over uh, three inches for the sensor. So let's talk about sensor installation and this will help you visualize too uh, uh, you know how it should be deployed. The um, sensor needs to go in. It's, it really should be installed into undisturbed soil. So what we recommend is you dig a hole to the desired depth. If you want to have the sensor at uh, two foot depth, you want to dig a hole that's two feet down, and then you want to have that hole big enough so that you can reach in there and push the sensor into the side of the hole. You know, if it's within arm length, you can push it in with your hand. Uh, if it's uh, deeper, uh, we sometimes use a uh, uh, like a two by four to push them into the side of the hole to give you a little leverage. That hole will likely need to be at least four inches in diameter to be able to to get down there and, and leverage that sensor in. Uh, you, uh, the next point is you want to install that into undisturbed soil on the side of the hole, and you want to be as careful as possible as you're pushing it in, not to wiggle it around because that will uh, create airspace around the probes of the sensor. You want to push it in uh, straight and cleanly and hold it there. Um, you also want to install your temperature sensor if you're measuring uh, the, the uh, soil temperature. Um, you know, and that's typically you want to measure it at the same depth, but you need to have it at least an inch away from the soil moisture sensor so that the, uh, the, the sensors don't interfere with each other because, you know, they are using... Uh, electrical measurements uh, in, inside, so you don't want them too close. And you don't want that temperature sensor near the ferrite core, which is on the cable leading to the soil moisture sensor. You can't quite see it in this picture, but there's a ferrite core just above that. Another question we get quite often is, uh, should I measure mount the sensor vertically like it's shown here, or should I measure it horizontally? Usually I'd recommend deploying it vertically like uh, it is here. Um, that's it's the most natural way to do it. It's easiest to install, and it's still a pretty specific depth. Sometimes you might want to twist it 90 degrees uh, if you're looking for a very specific soil moisture depth. So it's um, it's fine either way. It just uh, you know it gives you a little bit different profile of the soil either way. The other thing is when you're backfilling the hole. Uh, you want to match the soil type profile as best as possible. So as you're taking the soil out of the hole, keep track of you know the different soil types and, and put them back in the hole in the same sequence. And also be real careful not to disturb the sensors you're backfilling. It's not even a bad idea to have somebody holding that sensor in place while you're putting some of the dirt back into the hole just to make sure it doesn't get jostled around while you're, you're backfilling the hole. Um, yeah, you know, somebody. Uh, this is a, another question we get. Uh, can the sensor be installed upside down with the cord leaving the sensor in the downward direction? And uh, this is in regards to preventing a pathway for water entering into the uh, into the sensor. And you could do that. You know, sure, you could uh, flip it around and have the, the cable coming up from the bottom. But it's not necessary. The electronics inside this sensor are all encased in epoxy. It's uh, super waterproof. So there's no risk of water running down that cable and getting into the into the electronics of the sensor. So uh, again, in most cases, I just uh, I'd mount it just like it's shown here, and you don't have to worry about the concept of a drip loop. So that's the uh, installation side of things. Um, now I want to switch to, now you've got your sensor installed, do you want to set it up in uh, the Hobo Connect software? What's the process for that? Well, this is um, the, when you start up Hobo Connect, what it automatically does is it looks for all the loggers in the, uh, the area and 
when I powered mine up, I happened to have uh, some different loggers around. This is my uh, soil moisture uh, sensor. It's a 2307, which is soil moisture and temperature. And to connect to that, uh, you just uh, click on that uh, space. And then that'll bring you up to the, uh, the main screen for the, the logger. So this is showing how the logger is currently uh, set up. And you, know, you can just see the, kind of the basic information. You know, set up for 15 minute logging, for example. Now, if I want to go and configure this logger, you know, change the, the configuration settings, I click on this icon, which we call the configuration icon, which has a little pencil in it. So I click on that, and that brings me into the configuration screen. And here's where you can, I'll just kind of walk you through this. Now, I, I, I apologize for some of you that are familiar with the Hobo Connect software. I'm just I'm reviewing stuff you already know, but uh, bear with me. I won't spend too much time on it, but um, I think it's worth going through. You can apply a, a name uh, for the logger. You can assign it to a group, which can be handy in terms of setting things like uh, bulk offload up. You're just grouping your loggers together when you're looking for them in the field. You set up the logging rate here. Uh, I've just left it at the 15 minute logging rate. The software will tell you how long it can go at the that logging rate. So this uh, at this rate you could go for almost a year, and you set up the start mode on the next logging interval. That's usually what I recommend uh, rather than starting immediately because if you start immediately, your data is not going to be lined up on uh, even 15 minute intervals. So I like going with on next logging interval. Then if I scroll up some. I see these other choices on the screen. So the next choice would be, you know, how you want it to stop logging. You know, most people go with when it fills up. And then there's logging mode. There's a fixed normal logging mode. And here's something that I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a few slides, which is uh, we have what's called statistics logging, which allows different things like max and min uh, values to be recorded over the, the logging interval, or in this case, an average of the readings over the logging interval. So what I've set up here is a one minute sampling rate um, in a 15 minute logging interval. So it's gonna provide another data series, which is an average of those 15 readings taken over that 15 minute uh, logging interval. And that's, you know, that's, a, that's a pretty handy feature. I'll show you, show you why in a little bit. Usually you don't wanna set your statistics sampling any faster than one minute, because otherwise you start using up your battery pretty fast. But if you're going at a one minute um, sampling interval, uh, you, you'll get you know pretty good battery life, the two years that I've talked about earlier. Uh, there's different alarm settings, you know, whether you see the LEDs, Bluetooth always on. Here's what I talked about before in terms of selecting your soil type. Um, and if you wanna use um, or record uh, percent of field capacity, that's where you set that up. So when you're all set with that configuration, you just hit the, uh, disk icon to save that and it actually starts its deployment and however you set it up. So if it's on the next logging interval, it'll start uh, logging the next 15 minute interval. Now I'm gonna switch gears to the other side. So the data's, you deploy the data logger, now you wanna read out the data, uh, you wanna view the data, or you wanna share the data. And um, you'll see the screen looks a little bit different. Uh, now, what I'm showing now is the Windows version of the software. They're pretty much the same between the mobile versions and the Windows versions, but there's a, there are a few subtle differences. Functionally, they do exactly the same thing. And actually, I, one of the reasons I switched to the Windows version for this is um, uh, for looking at the data on graphs, uh, you, you just get a bigger display to look at so you can see what's happening with the data a little bit better. So I'll show you that. That's one of the things I like about the Hobo Connect environment, you can have it on your, your laptop, you can have it on your mobile devices, and you can go back and forth between them. So if you're out in the field and you suddenly realize, hey, I need to make a change to my configuration, you can easily do that with the Hobo Connect on your phone. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. So when I'm ready to read out the data, I just click out on this uh, readout icon, and it reads it out. Um, then I've actually skipped a step here. You gotta go back to Hobo Files. It automatically stores that data as a data file. And you can 
open up that data file and you get your data and it's you know you can you know, view it right away which is very handy so what i'm looking at here is soil moisture in my blue line and you can see i got a big rainfall event the other day um, this is deployed in the woods by my house which is very sandy loamy soil so you can see it uh, when you get a rainy vet it responds pretty quickly and then it, it uh, uh, percolates through the soil pretty quickly and then it kind of reverts to a more normal uh, soil moisture uh, you know drying uh, process or, or pattern it's interesting you can see how much the temperature data went up at the same time that's the red line here so um, we're kind of in the spring conditions here so uh, the, the, the rain water definitely raised the temperature uh, pretty dramatic of, of the soil in my woods one thing you'll notice about this is um, that there's a little bit of noise uh, on here. And that's it, it, normal in a lot of measurements you see it in the temperature. But this is where I want to show you the benefits of averaging your data. As you may have noticed, you know, when I was going through the configuration process, I mentioned uh, uh, you can set it up for averaging. Well, this is what happens. I took that same, this is the same deployment, but now I'm looking at the average data where it's averaged those 15 readings over the 15 minute interval. And you can see it just cleans up the data. So it gives you really, any one of those readings is that much more accurate in terms of its representation of what the actual soil moisture is. So here's, you know, before averaging, here's with averaging. So, um, and you can do that with a temperature channel too. You can see a little bit of noise in the temperature data as well. Um, so a nice feature to be aware of. The other thing I want to talk about is data sharing. There's a little icon up here with the, you know, the box with the arrow. Um, that allows you to share the data in multiple formats. You can sh share it as a Excel data file, a CSV data file, or as a picture file. And um, if you're running on a mobile device, you can share it via any of your, your messaging apps, so email or um, uh, you know, text messaging. You can, you can share the data in kind of anything that you have installed on your, your device. So let me just, before I go to this question, I just saw another question that ties to the software. And there's a question, does Hobo Connect run on a Mac? And uh, uh, a good question, because our, our Hoboware software runs on a, uh, um, a, um, uh, a Mac, but uh, the Hobo Connect software does not run on a Mac. So that's something to keep in mind. So it runs on Windows, I, iPhone, you know, I, uh, iOS devices, as well as Android devices, but not Macs. So oh, here's another question uh, that we commonly get is uh, why am I seeing negative soil moisture readings? Uh, what that means is your soil moisture sensor is probably in the air. The calibrated range of the logger is, is designed for soils. And in soils, uh, you'll almost always see you know, a positive soil moisture. The only case that if uh, the sensor is improperly installed and has air around those uh, the, the uh, soil moisture probes, there's a possibility that you could get a negative reading then. And that basically means you need to go and reinstall that, um, uh, that soil moisture sensor to make sure it's got good soil contact. Or sometimes you can uh, salvage it, the installation, just by pouring a lot of water on the soil to really saturate it and settle the soil around the, the soil moisture sensor. But you may need to reinstall it. Well, the other right way you can get a negative reading is um, if the sensor is too close to the surface. So that's another sign that you've got an installation problem. So next I wanted to um, just talk a little bit about a couple application examples. Just these are, are, are samples. Uh, I, I'm sure you're all coming into this with your own applications, but this just kind of kind of confirms uh, some different areas where, where they're going to work well. Uh, of course, uh, climate change is something that we hear a lot about. Uh, it's, it's hard to, to change the direction of that, but we can adapt to it by understanding what's going on. There's, um, you know, uh, 
not only is it ch changing the temperatures, but it's a changing precipitations, which is affecting uh, soil moisture uh, and the reduction of, of uh, water available in the soil at times, uh, which can stress the uh, plants, of course, but it can also affect the uh, uh, ecology within the soil, microbes and nematodes and mites. All, all these things are important for the soil health. And um, especially in the case of like decomposition, you need, these, you need to uh, maintain a healthy soil biome. Um, the soil moisture uh, and temperature are both important factors in that and uh, uh, very useful uh, for um, uh, recording with these loggers. Then, of course, you can look at it on your mobile device or a Windows device like I showed earlier. And, um, and the fact that you can log both the temperature and soil moisture at once, it makes it easy to look at those together. And then if you wanna combine them with other data, you can either do that in our Hobo uh, link platform, uh, which this data can automatically be uploaded to. I really haven't talked about that. I, sh I guess I should, uh, this is probably a good point to talk about that, is with, um, you can set a setting within Hobo Connect that allows your data to be automatically uploaded to a free Hobo Link account that you set up. And that's a great place to consolidate your data. Uh, and then you can extract that data, you know, basically whenever you want via the internet. So that's a very uh, handy feature of Hobo Connect. Another uh, example is uh, monitoring um, soilless media. Uh, you know, cannabis is getting to be a big industry as an example. Um, uh, in this case, uh, there's uh, you know, a lot of regulations around it. And uh, everybody's, of course, looking to maximize yield. That really applies to any crop you're looking at. Um, but in this particular case of cannabis and a lot of the indoor growing environments, uh, you're looking to use soilless media since it's, it gives you a little bit more control of your growing process and uh, your irrigation and your nutrients and all that. So uh, it's very handy to have the um, uh, ability to look at the data in um, with the soilless media calibration. You don't have to do any sort of uh, calibration after the fact of the data. You get the data in, in the, the right units right from the start. And it's um, because you can quickly upload it to your mobile device or uh, Hobo Link, you can um, have the data more at your fingertips for making the decisions uh, relative to your growing conditions. Another advantage is, uh, as I mentioned, the gateway uh, compatibility, the MX gateway, which is a product we also sell. Um, that can receive the uh, Bluetooth uh, signals and automatically send those up to uh, a Hobo Link account that you set up. In this case, it's a um, there is a subscription fee for the Hobo Link account, but um, that way you can get the data from wherever you are. So if you want to set these up in your greenhouse and then you want to monitor that from your house or wherever you happen to be at the time to make sure things are okay, you can do that. Uh, you can also get alarm notifications. I think if I remember right, yeah, um, this is one of the. The questions that came up a few times uh, in um, from those of you who sent your questions in advance. So I just want to talk a little bit more about this MX gateway capability. Uh, the first thing I should say is this uh, gateway is rated for indoor use. So it's, you know, it's not something for your remote sites. It's something like for greenhouses or if your uh, site that you're monitoring soil moisture in is close enough to an indoor structure. It connects to the internet via Wi-Fi or Ethernet. Uh, it sends the data to uh, your own Hobolink account um, and your account has a secure login so you can access your data from anywhere, anytime. And it also allows you in your Hobolink account to set up alarm notifications so that you can uh, get a notification in the form of a text message or an email when your conditions go outside of limits. And it's updating, uploading the data to Hobolink every 10 minutes. So you can get those alarm notifications almost in real time. And it also allows you to create 
custom dashboards uh, for displaying your data uh, in Hobolink with an option for uh, public viewing of that data. So you can share the, your data with others who might also be interested in that. You can also set up uh, automated data delivery by FTP or email to other, uh, uh, other computers or, or sites. Let's see. I'm just looking at questions real quick. Um, yeah, this, this is a good question. You know, can the Hobo Connect combine the graphs from two sensors in one location? Um, yeah, it, and uh, yeah, the answer is definitely yes for that. Um, it's uh, as we looked at uh, here. This is looking at uh, in, uh, two parameters from the same location. So. Um, yeah, that's one of the handy features. Now, if, if you've got two different locations that you want to combine the data, uh, then you, you need to uh, upload that data to Hobolink. That's how I'd recommend uh, getting the data, because then from Hobolink, you can export that as one CSV or Excel file that has all the channels from all your different sites combined together. So that's a very handy way of getting your data as one data file. So thanks for that question. Let's see. Oh, we had uh, some questions about this early on. So uh, yeah, just uh, we have several options now for monitoring uh, soil moisture, each with its own advantages and configuration. So starting with the, uh, the Hobo MX2300 soil moisture loggers, which we're talking about today, these are our uh, simplest to deploy because they're already connected. Uh, right now, the only sensor uh, we have in this platform is the Taros uh, 10 sensor. I did see that somebody earlier asked if um, uh, we could connect uh, a Taros 12 sensor, which is kind of in the same family. At this point, we're, we're not supporting the Taros uh, 12 sensors on this platform. It's something we may consider uh, for the future. It's certainly something that we I can say we've already had other requests for that. So um, something that we're actually, you know, keeping in mind. Then for a little bit more flexibility and more sensors, we offer the Hobo MicroStation. Um, so this has got memory in, in the station where you store the device. This has plug-in sensors for soil moisture, temperature, wind, uh, light, you know, pretty much your full range of uh, environmental and, and climate sensors that you can plug into this up to five sensors into one micro station. In this case, it only supports the, what I call the PCB type sensors, the EC5 and 10HS sensors. We don't have uh, plug-in sensors in the Teros family for this, the micro stations uh, yet. Now moving up to the um, our uh, web-enabled stations, we have the RX stations, which accept uh, up to 10 plug-in sensors. Uh, and again, those are the same plug-in sensors, which are the, you know, the, the EC5, 10HS type sensors. We don't have uh, Tero sensors that plug directly into the station yet. Then actually the uh, where we have the most choices in terms of soil moisture sensors is our Hobonet sensors. These are our wireless sensors which can communicate back to RX stations. And we have quite a few different choices uh, in our Hobonet sensors. And these are great if you're uh, monitoring a bigger area and um, you can have up to 50 sensors uh, communicating back to uh, one RX station. And there we have choices for the uh, EC5 slash 10HS style. We have Teros type sensors as well as grow point sensors, which allow monitoring soil moisture at multiple depths. So I'm not gonna talk any more about these today, but um, you can find out more information about these uh, on our website. I just wanted to let you know that they're out there. So kind of switching gears back to the uh, MX2300 series uh, soil moisture and temperature loggers. Here's uh, some of the accessories to go with them. Uh, HoboNet Connect, which I've talked a lot about, that's just a free download. Uh, we have links to that on our website, or you can go to the App Store or um, uh, Google Play and uh, download uh, the Hobo Connect app. Uh, and one thing I should mention about that is some of you may still be using Hobo Mobile, which is our, our previous mobile platform. Um, 
that platform does not support these uh, soil moisture loggers. If, if, so if you're using Hobo Mobile, you definitely need to upgrade to Hobo Connect. Hobo Connect basically does everything that Hobo Mobile does and more, like supporting these newer loggers. And that's uh, definitely the, the way we're moving in the future is all our new loggers will be supported in Hobo Connect and uh, not Hobo Mobile. The Taros Clip is a handy way of checking that you're getting good readings with your logger. You just slide it over the two prongs. It gives you a nice known uh, soil moisture measurement and a uh, great way to uh, check that you're still getting good measurements before deploying the, the loggers. Uh, replacement batteries. Um, uh, I would recommend buying these batteries from us. It's a, it's a battery that we've carefully qualified to, to operate over the full operating range of these loggers. So um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's worth uh, buying these through us. If you're going to be measuring air temperature, you want to be using the solar radiation shield to protect the temperature sensor from sunlight. And um, the MX Gateway, uh, here's the, the pricing. All these prices, of course, are US dollars. And there is a required uh, you know, service plan for using the Gateway. And here's the price on that. Um, I know many of you are located in other countries. Um, in terms of the wireless compliance, uh, right today, we have the support and, and uh, uh, approval stamps in place for uh, these countries. Um, and there's other countries I know that just kind of uh, uh, apply to these standards. Uh, these standards are great for ensuring that these won't be affected by other wireless activity in the area and that they won't be a problem for other wireless devices you have in the area. So these just are, are good standards for ensuring uh, wireless uh, compatibility uh, with everything else uh, out there that, that's wireless because it seems like everything is wireless these days. We're working on the compliance certification for Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, if any of you happen to be in those countries. So, um, that takes me through uh, the prepared slides I had. Um, I see that uh, several of you, you have been sending in questions and I have been trying to address some of those as, um, as we go along. And let me kind of scan through. This is a chance to add any questions that I haven't had a chance to cover. There's a question, um, you know, asking about will you have access to the recording, and, and absolutely, you will. Uh, we'll send. Uh, it, it probably usually takes us a couple of days to get it out, but we'll send out a, a kind of a thank you email. Thank you for attending, and in that we'll include um, a link to the um, to this recording, so you can uh, play that back, fast forward to the parts that uh, may be of interest to you. So, good question. Um, there's a question on, yeah, just to confirm, uh, there's a question about is the MX Gateway suitable for outdoor use? And, and um, yeah, let me reemphasize, it's it's only rated for indoor use up to, I forget, like 95 or 90% humidity, somewhere in that range. So yeah, you, you want to you wanna put that in, in a indoor environment to, to protect it. Oh, and there's another question about, uh, uh, will you guys be able to share the recording link with others uh, who weren't on this call? And uh, yeah, yeah, we encourage that. Um, it, uh, in, in, in addition to that, we're actually, we'll post uh, a recording of this webinar on our website. So, you know, if you lose the link at some later point, you can always go to our website and uh, find a link to this uh, recording uh, there. So yeah, we try to, yeah, and I'll talk about that in I think the next slide where we've, just like to capture a lot of information on our website that uh, you guys can refer back to later on. Uh, here's, here's a question that we get. Um, is the cable length limited to two meters or can it be customized? At this point, it is limited to, uh, to two meters uh, because we actually solder the uh, cables onto the printed circuit board inside the, uh, the logger housing. Uh, that ensures the most reliable connection and the reliable performance.
but it does limit our ability to do custom cable links. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually keeping track of all the requests like this. So, um, so I'll take this as a new product request. We, you know, we will, you know, consider options for um, longer cable lengths in the, in, in the future. And another thing to keep in mind, if you need to have more spacing, that's where our wireless sensors come into play. Uh, you can have your central station and you can use our wireless sensors and they have, um, Oh, I forget now. It's like a 1,500 feet, 2,000 feet range that those can communicate over, and they they use mesh networking. So if you're looking to have wider coverage, uh, those wireless sensors are a great choice to to keep in mind. Um, yeah, there's a question about how deep you can place the sensors. Yeah, that that two meter cable length does kind of limit your depth to to two meters um it, it we do have some people that will put the uh soil moisture logger the logger itself and bury that but that's a little bit dangerous the the soil moisture logger housing the, you know the actual data logger that's rated for weatherproof uh but not being submerged in water so i you know, if the soil gets completely saturated for an extended amount of time, that puts your data logger at risk. So uh, I typically recommend that the data logger be mounted slightly above ground level, six inches to a foot above ground level, so that it's not getting flooded. You know, splashing's no problem, but flooding could potentially uh, be a problem. And uh, here's another question, um, uh, you know, if the, area the soils get flooded and where this comes in is uh in coastal research areas we get we get some people that are looking in coastal areas and um these aren't the best sensors for uh, coastal areas where it's a high salinity uh and it's not not because of the flooding you know uh moisture wise they're fine the sensors are are, are basically waterproof so they're they're fine in coastal waters but if it gets too salty it gets outside of the the measurement range so you can measure up to, you know, get our standard accuracy up to eight uh, uh, decisiemens per meter. Um, you can actually measure up to about 20 uh, decisiemens per meter. And, but in that case, you may need to do some calibration of your data afterwards to get accurate uh, data. And above 20, uh, you're, you're, you're beyond the range that the sensor can, can, um, can measure. So you're kind of limited to, you know, you know, not pure saltwater sort of marshy areas. Um, soils. There's a question about sandy soils. Yeah, these sensors do okay in sandy soils. Um, that's that's the advantage of the 70 uh, megahertz um, uh, frequency that these sensors use. They they perform pretty well in sandy soils, certainly as well as any uh, soil moisture sensors. So, well, I see I'm coming up on the three o'clock time. So I'm actually going to, um, uh, I think I'm going to, to uh, wrap things up here. I um, I am going to go through the questions that you sent and any questions that we didn't get to in the webinar, we will follow up with you. There's, there's a, I think a couple of fairly specific questions uh, that uh, we'll follow up with you individually. And, um, I do want to uh, make sure you're uh, aware of our website, which is just a wealth of information, uh, full product specs and pricing. If you're in the U.S., you'll see all our prices up there. It's got webinars like this one are, are uh, available there. Uh, application information, tutorials, all sorts of good stuff. You can reach us by phone or you can um, contact us by email. Here's the link to the, um, um, the location on our site for sending us an email. So I just wanted to make sure to get that out. And finally, I just want to say uh, thank you to all of you for attending today. It's uh, been a pleasure having a chance to uh, to chat with you today. Hopefully I've provided some good information and I wish you success in your research and your work. So thanks. <laughs>